Um, hello again, welcome to OEN Engage. Thank you for joining us for tips and best practices in hosting the OER Adoption Workshop. My name is Tanya Groves and I'm the Director of Educational Programs for the Open Education Network. We're delighted to have you all here today. We thank you for the work that each of you do in our community to make education more equitable, accessible, and affordable through open education. We are based out of the University of Minnesota Twin Cities, which is built within the traditional homelands of the Dakota people. It's important to acknowledge the peoples on whose land we live, learn, and work as we seek to improve and strengthen our relations with tribal nations. We also acknowledge that words are not enough. We must ensure that our institution provides support, resources, and programs that increase access to all aspects of higher education for our American Indian students, staff, faculty, and community members. As we begin the session, I'd like to share a few important details with you. This session is being recorded, and as such, all attendees are muted. The video, transcripts, and slides will be sent to all registrants and to the OEN Google group after the event has concluded. Videos will also be posted on the Community Hub. We're thankful to have ASL interpreters present, present at the session. As such, we invite speakers to please say their names before speaking so that everyone can identify who is talking. Uh, we have allotted time at the end of today's session for questions. Please submit your questions via the chat. While we may not have a chance to address all submitted questions, we will try our best to do so. The chat will also be a space to share additional comments or reactions. We are committed to providing a friendly, safe, and welcoming environment for all attendees. You can learn more about our community norms at z.umn.edu slash OEN community norms. Please join us in creating a safe and constructive space. The hashtags for OEN Engage are hashtag OEN Engage 23 and hashtag more connection. Join us on Twitter at, at OpenEd underscore network. Uh, today, uh, we will be breaking for an icebreaker activity in just a second. Uh, you are welcome to, if you would prefer not to do that, you can stay in the main um, session. Um, feel free to join us if you'd like to, however. Um, then uh, when we're done with the icebreaker, which will take about five minutes, um, our presenters who are so gracious to be here with us today will introduce themselves and share their tips and best practices. So we welcome Josh Bolick, Emily Frank, Jennifer Landtrip, Kim Lynch, and Day Zing today. Uh, then we'll be taking any questions you may have and concluding. So on to the icebreaker and I will turn it over um, um, well, I'll, I'll read the instructions and then um, Lorraine's going to put you in um, breakout groups. So if you would take a couple minutes to tell your group something exciting that recently happened in your life, either personally or professionally, and then hand it off to another person. Um, if you have remaining time, you can ask questions. Um, again, if you prefer not to go to the breakout group, you can stay here in the main session. So we will give you about five minutes to go ahead and do that. And thank you, Lorraine, for handling the breakout groups. Welcome back, everyone. Wait to make sure everybody's here. Welcome back. I'll share my own exciting news with everyone because I get the privilege of being host here. Uh, my, my oldest daughter just got engaged, so that was fun. So now we're full, full on wedding planning. Um, so I hope you enjoyed the little either break or chance to get to know um, somebody else's uh, exciting news. We're gonna move on to the tips and best practices from our very well experienced um, OER workshop hosts here, um, Josh, Emily, Jennifer, Kim, and Day. Um, some of them will be sharing their screen. Um, and so when they're not, I'll have this slide up. Uh, when they are, uh, I will stop sharing and they will go ahead and, and start. So Josh, we invite you to go ahead and get started if you would please. And um, in the chat, I've put some of the information um, that I was mentioning with community norms and um, our different hashtags. 
So uh, Josh, we welcome you to uh, introduce yourself and, and share your tips and best practices. Sure. Uh, hi, everyone. It's good to see you. Um, I appreciate this opportunity. The OEN has been pretty core to my professional development um, starting in, I think, 2015. Uh, so, um, you know, been super important. So I was happy to say yes to this opportunity. So um, the um, so yeah, my name is Josh Bullock. I'm the head of the David Schulenberger Office of Scholarly Communication and Library. Or, <laughs> I'm conflating office names and book names. Um, so I'm the head of the David Schulenberger Office of Scholarly Communication and Copyright at the University of Kansas. Um, and the reason I conflated that with a book name is that that's the professional accomplishment that I talked about in my breakout room is that um, turning, we're, we're I, I've got a, a book project um, called An Introduction to Scholarly Communication Librarianship and Open Knowledge that is co-edited with Will Cross, who many of you probably know, and Maria Bond. Um, and that includes over 70 contributors, including some leading lights from the open education world, uh, a section dedicated to open education. Um, we, we're almost done with that, and we'll be able to turn it in, we think, later this week back to ACRL for publication later this year. Um, that's relevant, uh, and I'm not just rambling on about that, because um, we hosted a meeting at North Carolina State University in um, 2018 with about 40 um, invited folks from the scholarly communication community um, to sort of brainstorm what a book like that should look like and um, sort of principles that we should embed in it. And one of the ideas that came out of that meeting um, was this idea that um, so-called interpersonal skills were uh, important to the work. And I think that that's really relevant here. And so that's what I wanted to um, to, to focus on, just uh, the to talk about uh, acknowledging challenges and inviting critique. So specifically, you know, I think it's important that we recognize that instructor, the, the position that instructors are in, they're probably sp spread really thin regardless of the nature of their position. Um, at my institution, instructors can include adjuncts, lecturers, graduate students, postdocs, uh, tenure track faculty, teaching professors, professors of practice, and any rank at several in several of those types of positions. And by and large, they're critical thinkers by nature and by training. They often understand things by deconstructing them and pushing on core concepts. Um, and so like that's the way that they wrestle with something that's new to them is sort of to take it apart and then to study it and put it back together again as a way to understand it. Um, um, so um, they, but they came to a workshop to learn from you because they're interested in OER. And so like those, what can feel to a presenter like pushback or challenges or hard questions, um, they, those are engagement. And in, in most cases, they're an attempt to understand not to um, be rude or, uh, you know, I mean, if someone is being inappropriate, they're being inappropriate. But as long as things are, um, asked in a collegial uh, and appropriate manner that the those are opportunities um, that those folks often can become great advocates if you nurture their interest in OER um, and acknowledge the challenges and demonstrate nuance in your responses. Um, so like I, I would encourage you to lean hard into those questions and critiques, um, acknowledge the challenges that instructors face and let them know that you appreciate their interest and attendance despite those challenges. Um, that you wanna find creative solutions together or build a base of knowledge and interest in those issues. Um, they might find a way to adopt in their present moment, or maybe that opportunity will come along in the future, um, or maybe they become uh, a partner in advocacy, maybe like going back to colleagues and saying, I, I learned a lot at this workshop and you should get in touch with um, Josh or who whoever, um, or you all. Um, so, um, that's also an opportunity for you because every time you engage with those challenging questions, um, you sort of expand your skills and ability to answer those uh, situations. Um, and they might help you uh, highlight existing services or realize the need for additional services or advocate uh, for those additional services. So like as you build your knowledge and confidence addressing uh, these hard questions and uh, challenges, even try inviting inviting them. like. Um, not not in an arrogant way, uh, but as a model of intellectual humility and practical nature. Um, there are very real challenges to the forward progress of OER, right? Like it's not um, 
there's no magic here. Uh, OER is not a panacea. Um, so there's a good, you, you know, like we shouldn't gloss that over. We, we should acknowledge that and um, sort of that leads to better engagement between you and your audience. So um, there's a good chance that you're most the most knowledgeable person in the room as regards OER. And so you'll often have the answers sort of ready, but when you don't, you should acknowledge the limitations of your knowledge um, and offer to get back to them with the best information that you can find. Um, this community, you know, like if you email the OEN list, I promise that someone on the list uh, is gonna respond with helpful suggestions or solutions um, in the hundreds or thousands of times that people in this community have presented on these issues, it's rare that a truly new question will come up. And so that's an opportunity to leverage the collective knowledge and generosity that's present here. Um, in some cases, there won't be an easy answer. So the best you may be able to do is to provide related data or recommend a reading uh, or provide an example of how another instructor or institution faced a particular challenge and offer to stay engaged with them to try to overcome that and learn together. Um, but you know, in any case, and this is by way of closing, um, what you're building is a relationship or relationships towards problem solving, not a one-off engagement. And so um, sustained partnerships and support uh, require complexity and mutual respect. And so like, I, I think when you encounter those challenging questions, it's best to embrace that complexity and treat it as an opportunity. That's it, thank you. Thank Great. you so much for that, Josh. Um, you know, having presented with you a few times, Josh, I think you're an excellent model of both civil discourse and intellectual humility. And I've learned from you uh, how to be a better presenter. So thank you so much. Um, next on to Emily Frank, please. Thanks, Emily. Hi everyone, Emily Frank. I'm the Affordable Learning Administ Administrator with Lewis, the Louisiana Library Network. Lewis is an academic library consortium. Every higher ed institution with an academic library in Louisiana is a member of Lewis. Um, so some of my tips today, my first tip is that at the consortial level, um, our focus is really on building capacity and community in our train the trainer approach to help ensure our colleagues at the member libraries feel comfortable and confident to take on this work and that they feel supported as they do it. How we build capacity and community has shifted over time, but I would say it generally involves leveraging the collaborative nature of the consortium as our members prepare to um, execute their workshop. When we first joined the OEN, which I think was in 2016, uh, Lewis selected three librarians for our first Train the Trainer, which at that time was taking place in person in Minnesota. This small group of librarians uh, then collaborated really closely at every stage of the process and even went to one another's institutions for the adoption workshop to either co-present or be in audience cheerleaders. As we have scaled that statewide, um, our next step was we held two in-person train the trainer workshops in different areas of the state. We, uh, to build community and capacity this time, organized attendees into cohorts with the initial set of trained librarians being among those who served as cohort mentors. So in this approach, members relied on their peers in the cohort and their mentor to have support. Since then, we have hosted the Train the Trainer virtually and I've co-taught this workshop with the local presenter. Having librarians host and lead the OEN workshop, I think is really beneficial because it underscores the library's work and capacity in the affordability landscape on their campus. Um, but there are sometimes benefits of having me as an outsider come in. Sometimes this generates some interest and attention. And I think co-presenting has made this process of hosting the OER adoption work workshop a little less daunting for folks as they get started in this space. You know, it's just a lighter lift for everyone um, in that case. So that's tip one. My second tip is in tweaking the slide deck. So you all folks at your campus, you know your audience best. Um, and one thing I've had to navigate 
is my assumptions around what might resonate or not with a particular audience. And perhaps this is because I'm at the state level. So I know kind of historically thinking, I recall there being some parts of the deck that maybe didn't resonate with me as much as other parts. And so I had to spend some time sitting with those parts and my assumptions and work with my colleagues at the campus. Um, that reflective process, I think, ultimately allowed us to share content in a way that was intentional and with energy. And what I found is that sometimes those parts um, that maybe didn't resonate as much with me were among the most valuable pieces for members of the audience. I would have faculty come up to me after the workshop and share how they were really energized and emboldened by those parts. My third tip is to take some photos. So I know that we at Lewis are always wanting to highlight the work of our libraries on social media, in our newsletter. So if you're at a consortium, um, take a photo and pass it along as I am certain that they want to shine a light on what you're doing and promote what you've accomplished through the workshop. And then my final tip is to think about what the adoption workshop can translate to. So for those of you who are considering attending um, the Train the Trainer or hosting a Train the Trainer, maybe you attended yesterday's Train the Trainer walkthrough, I would encourage participating in these opportunities, even if you or some of your attendees don't have an immediate plan to go and apply the adoption workshop. What I've found is that the train the trainer process gives attendees more language for discussing these issues and also gives them the time and space to think about these issues um, within their context. The adoption workshop slides themselves are openly licensed. And as a result, I see these slides applied to lots of contexts beyond the adoption workshop model itself. I think the same is true for the talking points that you hear in that workshop. I, I hear those talking points applied in lots of different ways. So um, keep in mind that you might find ways to apply the train the trainer content and approach beyond leading a workshop on adoption itself. So with that, I'll pass it back to you, Tanya. Thanks so much, Emily. It's so helpful to have the consortial um, viewpoint. Uh, and I think Lewis has really been a leader in that area. So thank you so much. Um, next, we're going to turn to Jennifer Landrip, and I believe Jennifer will be sharing her screen. Yeah. So hi, my name is Jennifer Landrip. My pronouns are she, her. And so I'm currently a health sciences student success librarian at Pacific University. I'll talk about two main topics. So the first one is how to adapt your presentations and um, to pro and providing faculty with an option to review all OER content as opposed to only textbooks that can be found in the open textbook library. So the first thing I want to mention is that Open Oregon Educational Resources, which is our statewide organization for um, supporting and promoting OER at Oregon's community colleges and public universities, found that o the OER review workshops have had the greatest student savings per program dollar spent of any kind of professional development that they offer. So um, as of 2021, Open Oregon calculated a student saving of $36.33 dollars per program dollar spent for the OER review workshops. And they concluded that OER, the OEN membership and workshop model are an effective use of statewide resources. Um, so as a note, um, the updated savings data from Open Oregon is coming this summer to include the 21 to 23 bi biennium. So um, I next want to encourage you to adapt your presentation to your audience and your object objectives. So consider your audience's current knowledge and experience. And I understand that you, you may, may or may not know much about that, um, depending upon who's, who will be there. So, you might have some faculty who are completely new to the topic and some who have a lot of experience. So be sure to include the basics for those who are new so that they don't feel lost. Um, also consider the goals and interests of your audience. So um, are they just starting to explore and consider um, using OER or maybe they have an OER chosen and they really want to understand how to adapt it and, or maybe to include diverse perspectives. 
So uh, make sure your presentation will address some of the questions that you expect your audience will have. Um, and you should also discuss different types of course material and how they affect students differently. For example, so you know, not just OER, but your goal is really to help them to be able to think about critically about their decisions for course, course material. So what are the different access options and cost options for materials like print commercial textbooks, digital commercial textbooks, inclusive access, required homework software, digital OER, print OER, ebooks available through the library and course reserves. So how do the characteristics of each of these materials affect students differently? Um, and so educating faculty on these things is important so that they can make their own informed decisions when selecting their mature, um, course materials, including OER. Um, and finally, you'll want to provide faculty with steps for the adoption process and resources to help them with each step. So there's a lot required for faculty to be successful and several things you might want to mention are accessibility, copyright, course design best practices, designed to promote um, EDI, communication with the bookstore, considering print options, peer support, and institutional support. So, um, and then finally, consider your institutional OER ob objectives and it would, if it would make sense to include any of them in your presentation. So you definitely don't want to overwhelm faculty, but you do want to make the presentation relevant to their knowledge level, relevant to their goals, and you want to help them understand the landscape of course materials and their effects on students so that they can make informed decisions about their course materials and provide them with a step-by-step -step process for adoption along with supports to, to help them for each step along the way. So finally, let's talk about providing an option for faculty to review OER um, or all OER. So as it stands, the um, OTL's review workshop allows faculty to review open textbooks that are in the open textbook library. And it's a really excellent model and it provides faculty with open textbooks that they can like take off the shelf and use in their courses. So it's awesome. Um, um, so there are other OER that faculty may wish to use that are unavailable in the open textbook library. For example, this one here, Mineralogy is a website and it's not in a book form and it's not in the OTL. And so, um, since we see that like the review workshop is so effective, how can we apply it to these other sources? So how can we essentially be able to include these things? So um, Open Oregon has adopted a statewide model to offer a $200 stipend for faculty to review an open textbook from the open textbook library, or $300 for faculty who wish to review an OER that's not available in the open textbook library. And the idea is that faculty would receive $300 for finding and reviewing one or more OER that could provide course material coverage for an entire term. And with the idea that if they chose to adopt that, they, um, their course materials cost for that course would be $0. The stipends higher for these non-OTL OER because it takes more work um, to find and consider them um, because they might be found in different locations or in different formats. And so, um, the library director at Umqua Community College and I, when I worked there as a research and instruction librarian, worked together to create and implement this model at Umqua Community College. And then we shared it with Amy Hoffer of Open Oregon, who implemented it statewide. So um, you can read the details of it and how it worked in this. There's an article in this slide here that you could read. Um, so where are the reviews posted? Um, Open Oregon created a group in OER Commons where they post reviews. So I just checked in there like now 86 OER reviews and resources um, from these workshops. Um, and so it's definitely not, not as elegant as the OTL's review system. Um, it just is another option. So it allows faculty the opportunity to get a stipend for their work reviewing another OER. And it motivates them to do the work. It recognizes them for their time and it provides them a place to post their review so that other faculty looking at OER comments could find it. And really, um, when we were kind of making this idea, we agreed, or making this model, we agreed that faculty finding the review is probably secondary to the primary goal of like getting faculty interested, educating them, giving them the opportunity to explore OER and review it, and then recognizing this work by paying them a stipend. Um, and so you probably gathered the overall theme here is to be creative and discover what would be best to meet the needs of your faculty in order to best support their, your students. So have fun and be creative.
Thank you so much, Jennifer, for those creative and robust tips. Um, Oregon is always a pioneer in, in open education, so we really appreciate your time today. Um, next is someone I met very early on in my OER journey, and she's been so gracious with her uh, abundant knowledge in this area all these years. So Kim, do you want to go ahead and share your screen? Yes, I'll, I'll start with a brief intro before I, I share my screen, but um, first I just want to um, introduce myself, Kim Lynch. I currently serve as the Senior System Director for Educational Development and Technology with the Minnesota State System of 33 colleges and universities, 54 campuses, and that will become um, important to the tips that I share. Also, um, I do use the pronouns she, her, and I present today as an older white woman with blonde hair and a black scarf, if, um, if that's helpful as I, as I share with you my information today. What I really wanted to do is um, talk a little bit about really uh, three things that I think have helped us along our journey. First of all, I think it is important to recognize, like Emily, we're a consortial member, we have a system, it's, it's a, an interesting work to be thinking about how to build that adoption and awareness across um, thousands of faculty um, at in various different types of institutions. So I wanna talk a little bit about that. Also how we have integrated that work within our other faculty and staff development work so that it isn't sitting outside of that, but is in fact centered within it. And then the third thing that I think has been really important to uh, the work with this adoption and awareness is the scaffolding of experiences and opportunities. So you're starting here, but you're not ending here. And so a little bit of the, the background, we started, system-wide OER work eight to nine years ago. And not surprisingly, the first and ongoing foundation really has been our partnership with OEN and adoption webinars to build awareness. That is where we started and we have never left that foundation or that, that ground because it's been so important to the work. Again, in a system of thousands of faculty members, that need just doesn't go away because we're constantly looking for how to build that awareness and get an enthusiasm and excitement with a new group of those faculty members. So um, as a system, we do offer what I think of as cross institution experiences by really bringing together interested or, or even just intrigued faculty. So for us, having really three things has been key to that. One is in the intro webinar, and this has been facilitated by a faculty member who is very mature in her growth and experience with OER. She also leads some of the efforts I'm gonna mention later that we scaffold toward. So she's just been an integral part of that faculty peer-to-peer -peer experience. Again, mostly working virtually because of a system across a very wide geographic swath and really trying to still to build that community across the system. The second is the review site stipend. Many of you mentioned that, and I think that has been an important step in taking that exploratory first beginning beginning step. The third is really that wide range of opportunity beyond that, that faculty can choose to continue. They can adopt and adapt solo. They can just like do it the way they're doing it, or they can have layers of support based on really where they're heading and what they want to do. So I will just quickly share my screen to talk about or to share really two images that I think are helpful in looking at um, what we've been thinking about and how we've been approaching this as a system. So let me just take one moment to share this. And I won't, I don't think I'll do it as a slideshow. I'll just um, hope that that image is sufficient for you to see. What this really is, is a look at our last sessions legislative ask. And the reason I share this is because it highlights both the importance of foundational work, but also ways that we see that helping us build a, a really a house. You know, if you have a foundation, we're building a house of equity, accessibility, and affordability. And we do that in a way that either has an impact on those individual campuses, like faculty advocates and leaders of that local work. I think as Josh shared, those who push the edges and ask the questions often become the greatest um, advocates for the work. And then our ask also helps us continue connecting faculty across the system, particularly in their field of study via transfer pathways. If you're familiar with that, that 
type of work. This is really looking at uh, disciplines that go across colleges and universities, and where we really asked for some funding to help folks put together zero textbook cost transfer pathways that cut across is really our latest iteration of how we move beyond individual campus impact to really bringing that through our entire system. This was our ask. We didn't receive all of what we asked. It seems like we never do, but we did get a million 50,000. We asked for um, 1.5 1 million, 1 million 50,000. And so we are scaling that work to really do what we can um, within that, uh, that framework. The second piece um, that I would add is, I mentioned this integration with our existing offerings. We have a network for educational development where faculty really go to um, embrace development, whether they're faculty or staff. And we annually offer over 100 plus webinars, 40 to 50 short courses, and uh, 15 or so faculty learning communities. All of that in those six areas, it's a little hard to see, but basically in the areas of academic equity, academic technologies, accessibility, scholarship, teaching, teaching and learning, and open educational resources in addition to foundations. So the point with this is that we don't really see this work as separate from, but really deeply integrated with that, that work that we're doing at a system level for developing our faculty and staff in really important areas that move forward, in particular, some of our system initiatives toward equity 2030, equity by design. Lastly, I just want to mention or call out um, scaffolding experiences and opportunities we don't just offer these preliminary opportunities with adoption, but we really want to have them scale into other things. So I'll call out one that our OER coordinator and faculty member, many of you may have, have um, crossed paths with Karen, with Karen Pakula. She's really um, made this a very successful effort, and they're called faculty learning circles, or again, in the context of NED faculty learning communities. We've been offering them since 2018 and they allow participating faculty to collaborate with other Minnesota State faculty from across the system and really to do so with three options in mind. They can redesign a course around OER, they can create ancillary materials to complement an existing OER, or they can author a primary course resource. And each, um, each OER learning circle meets virtually over a five week period. We had this last year, I think 42 faculty from 30 campuses participating in those learning circles, 18 focused on course redesign, 14 on the development of ancillary materials and eight on the development and authoring of OER course resources. So again, the idea is that that adoption phase is a really great foundation and jumping point. If faculty want to into some deeper experiences, they've really, faculty in our learning circles have proven to be some of our greatest champions and have been instrumental both in our state and federal funding that we've received because, um, again, I think as some of you mentioned, when you can show success, people are really excited to continue to support and to move that work forward. So um, those are really the three areas that I wanted to mention, just how the importance of that foundational adoption, especially when you're thinking across a system, the importance of really connecting it to other efforts, and lastly, the, um, the importance of having things that folks can scale or scaffold or move into beyond that preliminary experience. Thank you so much, Kim. Minnesota State, as always, is impressive and inspiring what you do. Um, Kathy did have a question uh, that I'm wondering if you can answer quickly uh, as to whether you provide financial compensation for the faculty member who provides the seminar. Absolutely. So we do. Um, we provide compensation for in a variety of ways. I mentioned the stipends for faculty to review. We do provide our, our faculty learning communities or OER circles. They are compensated facilitators, as well as we do offer some compensation for the participants as well, based on the fact that they have a fairly tangible outcome. When we offer webinars and short courses, the participants are not compensated. But when we offer a learning community where they expect to have a tangible outcome, then we do compensate participants as well. Thank you for that. 
Uh, so we will transition to our final speaker, Dei Zhang from Renton Technical College, who is a brand new instructor for us or will be uh, for our certificate in open education librarianship. So thank you for being with us here uh, today, Dei. Thank you for inviting me, Tanya. <clears throat> Great to be with everyone. You can hear me okay? Awesome. Um, so as Tanya mentioned, I'm Dei Zhang. I'm the uh, instruction and OER librarian at Renton Technical College. Um, and I'm actually the first person in my organization to have OER in their uh, job title, um, which is really exciting. Um, so when I came on board, um, it took me a little bit of time to really assess like the OER efforts at the college, see who was leading those efforts, what was going on. Um, and uh, we were kind of doing OER already, but at kind of an ad hoc basis. There was a burgeoning um, grant program that a few um, administrators and one faculty member was kind of um, leading. Um, but the, the kind of details, it was like they had run like two cycles maybe. And uh, they had learned a lot, um, but a lot of those lessons had to be kind of put in place um, into a more established, a more a clearer, more structured program. So that's one of the things I kind of um, took on. And um, I really want to plug uh, the OEN librarianship uh, certificate program uh, because it really gave me the tools to think about this stuff strategically and um, to really look at like what is the infrastructure in my organization? Um, what personnel do I have? What advocates and sponsors can I lean on um, to really support our OER program? Um, as well as think about the culture. So around that same time, we um, began our OER steering committee, uh, which now has 11 members. Um, but initially it was just like three or four of us. Um, and we really wanted to set a vision um, as well as um, get this grant program really going. And then as people went through our grant program and did this am these amazing projects, we added them to the steering committee. So they became those like OER heroes for us and people um, that others could look to, uh, to um, learn more, but also see examples of how they could like get into their own OER journey. Uh, for example, like we've kind of had naturally um different different subject areas that we focused on um over the years right now we're uh doing a kind of a big organic push in the math uh subjects so we had um al roth one of our um math faculty do a, um, an open textbook on statistics um and that was a really great um example and in this um, cycle of the grants, we have two other math faculty that are wanting to do uh, math OER. And so that program has become a really great way to showcase um, OER um, and also kind of create those guideposts as well as those um, OER heroes that others can learn from and kind of follow behind. Um, so I just have maybe four-ish quick tips um, from doing a lot of OER adoption workshops. Um, the first one is scaffolding. And um, Jennifer talked about this a little bit, which is that you know different people will be at different points in their open education journey. And we know that there's a lot of misconceptions of OER, um, some myths, and you know when you're uh, talking about a specific topic, I think it's really important to have um, like a resource guide or a handout with just some of that fundamental um, foundational information about OER. Um, and I always also have like a 30 second to 60 second elevator pitch about just what's OER. Whether I'm talking about to an administrator, a student, faculty, they might not have even heard of OER. So it's like, you know, I might talk about the five R's or I might talk about uh, come at it from like a copyright perspective and and how OER is so beneficial because we have those permissions to use it uh, baked in. Um, so just like a, a really 
like good elevator pitch that will get their interest and kind of get them on the same page to learn. Um, and also maybe the first five to 10 minutes um, introduce the topic of open education or OER. For example, at a recent um, workshop I, I was doing about open pedagogy, um, I spent about 10 minutes just, just introducing the history of OER, um, including the open software movement and kind of the philosophy behind open. Um, so having that sense of history and kind of the why behind why this is even a thing um, before going into the main topic really like allows people to be like, oh, okay, that makes sense. And that is valuable. And let me, you know, let me invest more attention to this. Um, and then also pairing that with the libguide or the resource uh, that's available for them to do more um, of that in-depth investigation themselves can be really helpful too. Uh, number two is I would say really investing in professional development is essential. Um, as Josh mentioned, like don't you don't think of these as a one-off workshop, right? It's really about um, creating that culture and creating that support system to take this further and put it into action. So for me, um, that means like making sure our OER workshops are part of the regularly scheduled programming at the college. So we have faculty in-service days like built in at the end of the quarter, um, as well as the beginning of the year. Um, so making sure there's always an OER type workshop at one of those. Um, and often I'm the one to present on that. Um, but often partnering with our e-learning team, partnering with other librarians or faculty who have done OER, um, to sh whether it's showcasing like certain tools they can use, whether it's talking about uh, success stories, whether it's talking about support, like our grant program, talking about you know approaches or lenses like open pedagogy, like whatever it is, whatever we feel is um, needed or um, kind of a gap that needs to be addressed, um, we can kind of plug that in. And then another part of the investing is literally putting dollars behind it, right? Uh, several of you mentioned stipends. Um, we there's the OER grants, which uh, we have different levels. Um, the highest level is when they create an original OER. That's two thousand dollars. So um, and sometimes it's like they're working on a whole textbook and they should be paid more, but that's what we can afford, right? But really, that's just recognizing that they are really contributing to their field in a meaningful way, and it, you know, it, it makes a difference. Um, but another thing. Um, is that our e-learning director, um, she pays stipends for people to go to OER conferences or participate in our uh, PD Fridays. Um, like, and the PD Fridays happen every Friday and it's there's gonna be a workshop every Friday on an instructional topic, whether it's technology, accessibility, OER related, et cetera. Um, and so if they attend three per quarter and then kind of write um, like a plan to implement some of what they learned, they get $100. Um, they get $100 if they do our state, um, through our state board, there's an OER 101 course, that's two weeks long. Um, and that course itself is free, but we pay them to do the course, right? So um, investing in them to do that professional development um, has really been key. Um, and then number three, showcasing our OER heroes. Um, so um, your institution, just like mine, will have OER ambassadors of every kind. There will be administrators that kind of sponsor your program or fund it. There can be student leaders who kind of advocate for OER and lowering textbook costs. Um, they can be faculty who adopt OER. Um, and for us, our OER heroes are our faculty who have gone through uh, the grant process and they become resources and examples for others. Um, so recently at the Washington Annual uh, Canvas Conference, I invited one of our math faculty, as I mentioned, Al Roth, the statistics professor. Um, he, he presented with me about the OER grant um, and this had many benefits. Um, number one, social proof. The, you know, he was able to share his direct experience with the program and how he was supported. Um, number two, he was able to showcase like what he was able to accomplish through the program, show his textbook, show how he was um, integrating H5P things into his course and things like that. 
Um, and also number three, like there's folks from all over the state, right? Administrators, other colleges, um, and they were able to see how we at RTC support our faculty in OER adoption. And so it really uh, raises our profile. And that's one of the strategic things that our VPI um, let me know that she wants, which is like attend those conferences, tell our success stories, um, like help us be that kind of regional and national leader um, because we're doing great work and we need to tell others about it. Um, so it accomplished kind of all three of those things. Um, number four, just really quickly, is something I learned through the OEN um, Open Ed Librarianship Program, which is um, you have to know your audience and have the right pitch, depending on the audience, right? So if you're talking to students, obviously cost savings is going to be the most salient point. If you're talking to like faculty, um, maybe collaboration, maybe um, they're going through tenure, maybe this will be a great project for them to showcase, um, or maybe they can get together with um, other peers at other colleges and create something beautiful. Um, if you're talking to administrators, right, like I mentioned earlier, like, how are you telling your story? How are you getting, um, you know, like, getting interest um, and kind of helping us raise our profile for our college? Um, so, those are kind of some approaches when you have these conversations or have these meetings or have these trainings. Um, and yeah, thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Day, uh, for those helpful tips and all the things you've learned and done um, at Renton Technical College. So thank you so much for that. Um, just wondering if we have a few minutes for questions, uh, if you wanna type your question in the chat. Uh, anyone can um, unmute as well, and our speakers would be happy to answer the question. As you all are thinking, um, I will go ahead and read some of my concluding language so I make sure to get it in. Um, once again, thank you so much, presenters. We so appreciate you sharing your expertise with us today. Um, thank you everyone for joining. If today's session sparked ideas or thoughts or questions, we encourage you to continue the conversation with your fellow community members in the OEN Google group. We will also have a space for continued discussion on this topic tomorrow um, at the Engage Encore session happening from 2.30 to 3.15 p.m. Central. Uh, finally, we wanna remind you that this session has been recorded and will be shared with you via email and posted on the community hub. Slides and transcripts will also be linked. Um, and I see a question has come in from Jenny. Has anyone incorporated more active learning and or hands-on workshops, um, search time in the faculty workshops? Anyone wanna take that? I, I mean, I can just quickly jump in and say that we have, I haven't done that in the workshops because there's kind of there's so much information to cover that like creating that time or asking for more time is kind of a stretch um for you know to get to maintain to get and maintain their attention but i i have done flipped things where like um through the registration process they're really pointed at maybe particular collections in the oen and really strongly encouraged to um, identify a work um beforehand uh, and so that some of that uh, kind of um, hands-on stuff is done as pre-work. And of course, always happy to follow up with someone afterwards and sit down with them. Um, Kathy also answer in answering that question says, we have done a treasure hunt type of thing and another where they could identify language matching our mission statement. Not sure if it brought measurable results, but more active, I think she's suggesting. Uh, anybody else want to address that question or answer it in a different way? Okay, then I'm going to move on to the next question. Jeff asks, uh, Day, you mentioned an elevator pitch with a copyright approach. A lot of faculty tend to use copyrighted resources with a bit more flexibility than all rights reserved would suggest. Maybe as much as fair use should expressly, uh, expressly allow for. How do you talk about the five R's when someone says, but I'm already doing that? Good question. Yeah, um, I feel like that's that's a great uh, conversation to have with like a follow up one on one. 
and maybe and I do so many of those it's like th those workshops are kind of uh, a, a place to get the conversation going um, because as many of us mentioned like people are at different points or have different ideas even reservations misconceptions whatever about OER um, and uh, so you kind of start that conversation and then you you might like invite them to like oh I I want to learn more about your course or what you teach or the materials that you're um, I, I lost count of how many times I've asked to be added as an observer or student to someone's course um, and just just with the I just with the kind of frame of I'm so interested in what you teach and what you're using and since you know you're sharing this this uh, idea with me or the fact that you do OER like can I take a look um, and then we can kind of have that conversation about copyright and um, maybe there's maybe consider this resource or maybe um, uh, I noticed this um, and yeah <laughs> sometimes those conversations can be tricky because they have they might have a misconception or they might not be doing something that's copyright friendly um, but I, I think it's important to have that rapport and that relationship um, and just a curious approach and be a resource to someone um, does that answer the question I'm not sure Jeff is saying yes that's a cool idea thanks uh, any other questions? We have about two minutes remaining. Thanks for that, Josh. A reminder that it's not anyone's job to be copyright police. Okay, well, we are just about out of time. So thank you so much for being with us uh, today. We hope that you have a great rest of the day. We hope to see you tomorrow for uh, the Train the Trainer Open Pedagogy workshop, which is brand new, uh, and engage Encore sessions where we can dig in a little bit deeper to all the topics we've covered. Thanks so much.